Morning everybody. Um, over the years we've heard some really cool talks from some amazing presenters and so for today I thought I would do something a little different and that is that we are going to go on a virtual field trip together. And so we're going to head to a Pacific island and collect some research samples from the marine environment, the sea, and bring them back to Cawthron for the chemical analysis on a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. A couple of things just um, before we kick off. I hope you've all got a valid passport with you. We don't want anyone getting stuck at airport security. <laughs> And the other thing is I just encourage you all to sit back, relax, kick off your shoes and embrace part of the Pacific Way. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. In the, oh sorry, one other thing I do want to say that from here on out all the photos that are part of this presentation are all ones that I've taken myself either with underwater cameras or a drone. And so in the Pacific it's really important around collaborations and connections. So before we even leave New Zealand, we need to contact the national government to ensure that we have permission to be able to undertake the sampling exercise that we want to do. They're going to want to know all sorts of information like what is going to be the benefit to the Pacific nation, what is the purpose of the research project and what sort of samples are we going to collect, and most importantly, is it going to impact the environment? That's really key to everybody um, that relies on the marine world. Then, once we get to the country, we've got to go to the national government and receive our collection permit. Or in the case of the Federated States of Micronesia, had to then actually go to the local government and get a special permit for the particular collection site that we were actually wanting to go to. Another really key and important piece of um, thing that we've got to do is we've got to respect the local culture and customs of the indigenous people. They will rely on the reef system for both sustenance and trade, and so it's really paramount that we respect that and we adhere to anything that they would request. Of course, in the Pacific, English is a second language, which adds a complication to everything, and in remote places, it's often extremely limited. This is a hurdle that we need to be able to overcome, as we have to be able to communicate to them and show them that actually we're here to try and help, and it's going to benefit them in the long run, and most importantly, we're not going to damage the reef system. So, once we've got all that sorted, we've got the permit done, we've got the OK to cross the land and into the water, then it's time to get stuck in. So we dive straight into the water. Then while we're in the marine environment, we come across an array of different fish species as well as marine life. And unfortunately, we can't actually communicate with them. As Tom said, I'm a spear fisherman. I wish I could. It would make my trips out on the water so much more successful, but you can't. So we've got to gain the information that we need by observation. And this is going to include things like the diet. Are they herbivores? If they are herbivores, what macroalgal species are they grazing on? They could be parrotfish that are actually eating the coral reef themselves. Maybe some of the seagrass beds are holding different species. Maybe they are omnivores, so then therefore they're actually eating the macroalgae as well as predating across uh, onto other species. Or then in the highest trophic level, we've got the carnivores, which of course will be predating on other species. So we want to observe and find out what species are they actually predating upon. They may be scurrying out over the sand looking for mollusks, or they could be a scavenging species like the moray eel that is actually just feeding on dead and decaying animals that are already within the reef system. Other key pieces of information are whereabouts are they hanging out? Could they be kicking around in staghorn coral like this one here? Maybe they're hanging out over the reef system or out over the sand. Also we want to know what sort of behaviours are they displaying? Are they solitary or are they schooling together? Or maybe they're cohabitating with other species and so then therefore you've got this little mini ecosystem in a particular part of the reef system. All of these bits of information are really essential for us to get to ensure that our sampling exercise is a success because we don't want to take anything from the marine environment that doesn't need to be taken. Life is really precious and we need to respect that. So while we are out in the marine environment and we see these great fish, we also come across some pretty amazing things as well. Like this white dolphin that was seen out in the Marlborough Sounds. Maybe a big pelagic like this yellowfin tuna in the Cook Islands. Of course there's the sharks. This guy here in particular, was, I was swimming along in about two metres of water in the Solomon Islands and he came up blindsided me and ended up biting my camera which freaked the living daylights out of me as you can imagine. <laughs> um, or you come across big stingrays, the photo itself doesn't actually do it justice but this particular specimen had a wingspan of about two and a half metres and was incredibly friendly. <laughs> you of course come across crabs, definitely don't want to get your fingers near the pincers, that hurts, I have learnt from experience. Um, or moray eel, like the bottom one down here. These are really territorial animals, and so you need to be able to respect that, and they will attack if intimidated, so you just have to ensure that that's okay. Or alternatively, you may actually come across a snake. So this particular guy here is called a sleepy snake, 
and Ron Fife actually found it beside his bed when we were staying on Lola <laughs> Island. Much to um, our surprise, as you can imagine, and our fright, uh, yeah, we came across it. But lucky for us, um, we had a bottle of whiskey, so by the time we had finished that, um, we had forgotten about the snake and were actually <laughs> able to sleep at night. <coughs> the next day wasn't quite so good, but anyway. And so then, as we're going through, and depending on what the research question is, and depending on what sort of samples are being collected, we need to set up a variety of kind of in-field stations. This could be something as simple as just snorkeling, like Tomo and myself did, up in the Bay of Islands to collect some samples. Or maybe we're working on the back of a boat, like what Lincoln and Tomo and myself did when we were collecting samples from a toxic algal bloom that was occurring in the Polaris Sounds. Or in the case of the salmon program, we've actually got to set up a full field laboratory to enable us to collect biopsies from all the various organs, muscle types, as well as split the blood into different fractions so that we can analyse it for all the different bits and pieces that we need to. As you can imagine, when we're out on the water, this is the good days, like this one here. Beautiful, glass out conditions, absolutely perfect, really nice to work on it. And then the not so good days, like this passage here which was going down to Stewart Island and it was so rough that we were taking waves clean over the front of the boat and the captain told us it was too big that we were unable to turn around even though we should have. Unfortunately on that one, it was about 95% of the people on the boat were extremely ill which made it for quite an unpleasant and slow trip. But it's right, it happens. And so, depending on what that research question is, there's a really diverse range of samples that we could collect. These can range from epiphytic toxin-producing microalgae, like this one here, which is gambidiscus, which is the causative organism of ciguatera fish poisoning, which is really prolific around the Pacific Ocean and affects many indigenous people. Maybe we're collecting macroalgal species, just depending on what the actual environment is, or echinoderms. These ones here in particular were linked to a mass mortality event that happened in the Cook Islands, and actually a few months after that, an additional mass mortality event happened in Hawaii. Maybe crustaceans, like these crayfish, or crabs. And of course, lots of different fish species from all trophic levels. And so again, it all links back to what is our research question and what are we trying to answer. An interesting thing is that sometimes we find the best samples in the most unlikely of places. An example of this is the stick, which is down the bottom right-hand corner here. Of all the samples that were collected in the Federated States of Micronesia, the only sample that actually had any toxin-producing organisms on it was this. Swimming along, it's just a stick. Poking out of the reef system, no idea. It had some growth on it, thought I'd collect it, and ended up being an absolute treasure trove. Compared to all the macroalgal species, it had absolutely nothing. Then, once we have collected our samples, and it's time to leave the country, the biggest and most frustrating hurdle presents itself, and that is border control and customs. While you're there, oh sorry, you need to ensure that your permit and all of your paperwork is absolutely perfect, otherwise they will not let you back into the country. This is then complicated by the fact that different Pacific nations have got different sort of regulations. So in the Federated States of Micronesia, they wanted to know everything. Where were the samples collected from? How many samples were collected? Why were they being collected like that? Just every piece of information you can possibly imagine they wanted to know. Or the Cook Islands, which are heavy affi heavily affiliated with New Zealand, they are actually a lot more lenient, and so they just really want to know where you're collecting the samples from and how many kind of samples are you going. Or the complete other end of the spectrum, you have the Solomon Islands, and as harsh as it sounds, they didn't actually care what samples we collected. All they wanted to know is were they going to be involved in the publications and any sort of research outputs that were going to come from it, because that's what their bosses would want and further up through the government. So over the years, I have spent many hours sitting in airports waiting for um, authorities to check the paperwork, check the samples, make sure that everything is okay. The difficult thing with this is usually you've been travelling for 20 or 30 hours before, by the time you get to customs. So as you imagine, you've got a little bit of a short fuse. You kind of want them to hurry up so you can just get home. But eventually, after several cups of coffee, maybe a beer, depending on the time of day, they do give you the OK. We can keep our samples and then we're able to head home. So then once we are home, then this is where the real serious stuff begins. And so depending on, again, what the research question is, will depend on what sort of analyses is going to be performed. For the samples that we've collected today during this virtual field trip, we're going to be analysing them for the chemical analysis of marine biotoxins. And so that involves extracting the samples, 
we need to go through and do what they call a series of cleanup steps on those samples. And that's because the matrix co-extractors can confound the results and we may get a false positive or a false negative. And we need to ensure that the integrity of the results that we're reporting is of the highest quality. So once we've gone through and we've done all of this, we can then analyse them on the triple quadrupole mass spectrometers. We're really fortunate here at Cawthron that we've actually got three different types. So this one up here is the Shimadzu, an AB Sykes, and the Waters instruments. These are really complicated pieces of kit, and depending on what sort of toxin class we're looking for, will depend on what one we're running it on. For example, the routine um, biotoxin monitoring run them all on these Waters instruments here. And the technicians that operate them have got to go through a really vigorous training process to ensure that they can operate them effectively and efficiently. This is twofold. One is for, to ensure that the integrity of the results that are being reported, but the other one is to ensure that we actually look after these instruments. You know, this one here is around $700,000, and so we need to ensure that you know, they're going to be kept at the best condition possible, and we're not going to be doing anything that could damage them in any way. So, once we've gone through and we've collected our samples, we've now extracted them and analysed them, it's really important to be able to disseminate our research findings out to the masses and all the interested parties. There's several ways that we're able to do this. One of the most common ones that we do as scientists here is in publications. So you may be publishing in journals like Harmful Algae, Tetrahedron Letters, maybe Marine Drugs. Maybe you would write a book chapter. So myself, Tim and Mike um, wrote a chapter on sample cleanup prior to toxin analysis for the analytical or the comprehensive analytical chemistry book that got published last year. Or maybe you're presenting at conferences. There was an Indo-Pacific fish conference that Leslie and myself went to in Tahiti. Maybe the international conference on harmful algae which happened over in France and there were several, several Cawthronites over there. Or one that I'm going to be attending really shortly is at the Gordon Research Conference which is going to be in America. Other ways that our information or our results are able to be used is you may be part of an advisory panel and so then therefore our research findings will be used to maybe define what a new regulatory limit should be on a toxin class. Or maybe it's actually just an interested body is wanting to know what is the diversification of a particular um, microalgal community within a reef system. And so then therefore there's a lot of ways that we're able to pass on these research findings to the masses. So once all of that is done, we get to sit back, crack a bottle of wine, and enjoy the sunset. That concludes our virtual field trip for today. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Thanks for coming along. Thank you.